So Calhort board member who will introduce tonight's speaker, Carol. Hello, everybody, uh, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we have a great speaker here. He's really well known around uh, at least the Valley area and parts of LA. He's been a longtime teacher at Silmar High School over 15 years, um, expert on growing all kinds of vegetables, tomatoes, uh, fruit, fruit trees, all kinds of plants. He's just turned out many, many uh, high school horticulturists and um, also donates a lot of the food that they grow at the high school um, to people who have food insufficiency. So um, we're really delighted to have him tonight. And this is going to be more of a Q&A. Um, and so you can bring your best, toughest questions to Steve. And <laughs> we're, counting, we're counting on him to step up to the plate and answer them for you. And um, lastly, I did want to share, uh, we're having um, uh, a sale on April 2nd at Baker's Acres. And Steve is donating a six pack of tomatoes to anybody that's been at the webinar tonight and comes to the plant sale. So uh, look for the details on that. And uh, Steve, it's all yours now. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I'm a little bit nervous with this. I started looking at the people that are here. I know several people and um, yeah, it's good to see everybody, or not see, but to uh, talk to everybody. Um, can I share my screen? Is there a way to do that? Yes, you can. At the bottom of your screen mm -hmm. or the Zoom interface, you should see a green button that says share screen. Okay, good. I'm going to put a couple things up here. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. So far, I only see you okay so you don't see i thought i was sharing my screen so let me try it again share screen oh here we go whiteboard maybe how about now yes now we see it okay do you see it my my um powerpoint yes okay good 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 okay so we'll just leave that there um, I apologize. I just put this PowerPoint together. I'm going to be doing um, uh, a few talks up in San Francisco in April, and uh, I wanted a backdrop of some PowerPoint, just some tools to help me out here. So it's kind of cool. These are all pictures of stuff we're doing right now, planting our tomatoes, getting ready. Um, again, some of you know me. My name is Steve List. I've been doing this forever and ever and ever. Uh, uh, I teach here at Selmar High School, and I also um, lecture for the city of Los Angeles. And I'm happy to announce that um, starting Saturday, we're back after a two year hiatus, um, vacation, pandemic, whatever you want to call what we had, it was pretty crazy. And uh, so I'll be back. My first talk will be at Griffith Park and then um, Griffith Park, we do South LA, uh, Lopez Canyon's my favorite. And then we're gonna go out to San Pedro the first Saturday of every month and do some lectures out there. So if you're following me on social media, uh, you'll see I post that stuff all the time. I try really, really hard with my social media to only post plants and school and eh, there's a little family a little rock and roll in there but uh it's always positive i don't like anything to do with politics or pandemic or anything that brings you down when i do social media i want to smile so if you're following me and you're posting politics or crazy stuff i will block you okay so beware um yeah yeah we do have a request if you can put the presentation in full screen mode i'm going to i'm going to I was just getting uh, kind of introducing. And um, uh, as we get going, we will do that. I do like questions and you can interrupt me. Try to try to keep your questions to pertaining to what I'm talking about. Um, do your best not to stump me. I know we have a lot of really high end experts in this group. I know a little bit about a lot of things. So nobody in this field, and I think we know is a uh, great expert on um, gardening all the way around. It's a, it's a crazy business. Um, 
I'm still studying and learning. And I've been doing this uh, since I was a little kid. My, my mother used to carry me or, or walk me around at Green Arrow in a wagon. I ended up working there. So I have been in the business a long time, but I don't, you know what? I don't know everything and I'm hoping I can learn a lot from you guys. What I talk about is all stuff that I've done. Um, I've researched it, but most or 99.9% .9 of everything that I'm gonna show you is what we've done here at school or what I've done in the field throughout my life and um, the success way. And if you think you have a better way of doing it or you're doing it a different way, great. Maybe you could share those tricks with me too. It's not the only way to grow tomatoes, but it is a really good way. And one of my mentors, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure everybody knows, Steve Goto, um, who passed away two years ago, a month ago, about two years, one month ago, um, right before pandemic, he passed away. And he taught me a lot. I knew him for many, many years. They called him the tomato king and um, I don't think I'll ever ever be able to match up to what uh, what he has taught me so hopefully I can carry on his legacy and teach you guys some things so let's let's take this and do we have any questions yet anybody anybody want to ask me a couple quick questions there was a question uh, related to the Griffith Park event uh -huh. what date and time that was for okay, that. Um, let me, I'm going to show you something here. Can everybody see this? Let me see if I can make it. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, this is the link down here, lacitysand.org, uh, compost workshops, lacitysandeventbrite.com. They are requiring reservations, and from what I gather, everything's sold out. So. I'm glad, I'm happy about that, but that doesn't mean I can't get you in, you know the boss. So if you come in and sneak around and say hi to me, who knows? Um, it's Griffith Park is this Saturday, that would be March 12th, nine o'clock in the compost area. And I'm gonna be um, talking about tomatoes again, uh, uh, spring vegetables. So the whole month of March, we'll be doing that. But they are requiring you to register. They have COVID protocols on hand which I really don't know how we're gonna do this. I, pro I told them I would not be the VAC police or anything like that. So we'll see. I know they won't, we won't need masks. So that's a good thing. Um, if you want, I will give you my phone number. And if you would like to come, um, give me a buzz and, and you could be a guest. So it's gonna be a little tricky this month, but I think everything will open up uh, by April. So that'll be just anybody can show up. We were averaging 150 people at Lopez Canyon prior to um, the pandemic. So I'm hoping we can get back to that. Every month we do a different topic. Every month we give stuff away. I have some guest speakers. Uh, they have composters. It's pretty cool. I, you know, and, and it's kind of a social event too. You'll meet a lot of people. So let's go back. Here we go. Now I'm going to go full screen with this. Again, let's go. I had presenter view. Did that work? How's that? No? Exit. If you hit end show in oh, the top show, left. End show. Okay. And then on the bottom right, next to where you magnify the slides, to the yep. left. There's like a little screen uh, to the left a little more. There? That screen, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. It's been a long time since I do, do PowerPoint. Um, when you're doing high school stuff, the way I teach, I don't like to lecture too much. I don't like the, to keep the kids to listen to me. I make them go out and work. And as they're working, I talk and hopefully they learn something by the way I teach. It's, it's hard to lecture teenagers. So anyhow, um, to begin with, here we go. It's March and we're ready to plant tomatoes. You should plant your tomatoes right now. Now is the time. I used to say uh, uh, March 15th, and that was kind of like you were sure there wouldn't be any more freezes. We never know with Southern California, but we haven't had a really freeze in the San Fernando Valley or LA area for a long time. So I want to get my tomatoes in as fast as possible. The sooner I get them in, the sooner they're going to get rooted, the sooner 
um, I'm going to start harvesting. And one of the worst things with tomatoes is as it gets too hot, um, they pretty much stop growing and then you have your problems. Um, this last two years have been for me the best two years I've ever grown tomatoes because we've had very mild Julys. And um, one thing you can know at if if it's 100 degrees, a tomato plant will stop growing. If it's 110 degrees, your tomato plant could die. So knowing that kind of helps. Also, your key temperatures for your tomatoes to really get started and, and get going, I call it the 70-70 theory. So an average of 70 degrees in the day, an average at night. So if you have like, uh, let's say 80 in the day and 60 at night, there's your 70-70. So look at the, at the weather there. And you'll see that they'll really start growing and their optimal conditions is 70, 70 plus. So we have, there we go. Can everybody see that? Oh. Yes. Does that make sense? Does everybody agree with this? I think you may have zoomed in the Oh. In that last slide, it was zoomed in a lot. Too much. Okay. What it says is, should children be taught how to grow food as part of their schooling? Absolutely. I think we need more of this. It's good therapy for the kids. And if you've ever been to my school, which everybody is always welcome, they can come by and visit me pretty much any time. Um, weekends are really good. But during classes, the kids get out and they're just different people when they come into our ag area and the little ones and understanding healthy eating and being able to grow your own vegetables is just so important. And, and it's just, it's a shame that we don't have this like we used to. Um, I believe there's probably maybe 15 high schools that have programs that are similar to mine. But I just threw that in because it's, it's, it's important to me. Educating the little ones on things like this is very important. Okay, all right. I like to grow my tomatoes the lasagna method. And this is something that Steve Goto taught me. And the first thing you wanna do is your location. Location, you wanna make sure that you have full sun, all day sun, from sun up, sun down. You want the full sun as much as you possibly can get. Second is your container. And it's very important you get a large container. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, the smallest container you should use is two foot by two foot by two foot. A tomato plant has that big of a root system. Um, people say, oh, I can grow a tomato in a 15 gallon. Yeah, you can, but you're not going to get the most out of that plant. They have big, big root system. So these are 45 gallon tubs that I use. And there's one, I, I will plant one indeterminate tomato per Pot, and we'll get to the difference between indeterminate and determinate in a few minutes. I think most of you all know this. This perhaps could be just a big review for most of you, but um, possibly you, get, you could get some good hints and um, a little bit of help. But anyhow, um, large pots, full sun in containers. And what we do is we layer our soils. So I do a combination of different Kellogg's products and my own compost. So the first layer, what I like to do is I put down our own compost a layer of about six inches. And it's very important to pack it down because all this is organic matter and it's gonna decompose and your soils are gonna go down and they're gonna sink. So if you don't pack it down by the end of, uh, you know, maybe into June and July, your soil level is going to go way down and the roots aren't going to have anywhere to grow. So it's very important as you layer your soils in these containers is to pack them down. So the first thing I do is I put a layer of our compost and then I put a dry organic. And I always like Kellogg's. Kellogg's is a good company for me and it's a good product. They're local and they like to help the schools out. And they're GNB um, dry organics is what I use. And by the way, everything that we grow here that's edible, we do organically. And that doesn't mean that I'm against synthetic, but I'm teaching the kids how to do organic gardening. And then as far as landscape plants and flowers and all that, we grow synthetically. So I show them the, the differences. But our tomatoes are 100% organic. 
So we put our first, uh, our first layer of compost, we put a, a layer of the dry organic, and then I'll put in a potting soil. Um, I like, you know, some of this, this purple bag down here is good. I also like, um, let's see if I can, here we go. I also like the, um, this is relatively new. The, the blue bag is a biochar in there. And I like that one too. So I use, I, in these particular uh, containers, I'm using the biochar blue and white bags here. I'll put a layer of that and then I'll go back here and I'll put another layer of the dry organic fertilizer. And then I'll go ahead and do a, a layer of our compost, another layer of the dry organic fertilizer. And then my last layer, I like mixing the raised bed mix and the Harvest Supreme. And I've got four or five different layers with the dry organics in there. And the thing you got to understand about the dry organics is they take a lot longer to break down. So by the time the roots start to get down into those areas, those dry organics have broken down and the roots were readily accepted. So we have back here. So there you see, and you see these heavy duty cages, very, very important for your indeterminate tomatoes to get a strong, sturdy cage. Um, if you've ever grown tomatoes and you get those little flimsy, uh, tiny uh, uh, tomato cages, they, they tend to fall over. And I tell people, if you're gonna use those, you better stake them up. So this is what we've got, I'm sorry. We do have two questions. Good, go ahead. The first one from Suzanne, where can you buy these products? Okay, all of your um, Kellogg's products, I would recommend going to, I prefer Green Thumb. Um, I don't know where everybody lives. Sago Nursery, um, Armstrong. I, I'm a, a big fan of the smaller nurseries. I tend to stay away from the box stores just because I'm old school. Uh, so Green Thumbs, um, but you know what? Uh, Lowe's I've seen has a ton of Kellogg's products. I believe Home Depot does too but you wanna really try to, to uh, support your local nurseries. Um, let's see, there's Sunset, Gar Sunset Nursery on Sunset. Um, but uh, I, I tend to go to Green Thumb and Canoga Park. That's always my favorite, but you know, I'm, I'm old school. I, I started out at Green Arrow many, many years ago. Does that answer the question? I think so, and that was from uh, Susanna, excuse me. And she said, thank you, Sago Nursery for me. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the you, next say question. Say hello to Dean for me. He's an old friend too. Was there another question? Yes, from Sarah. Uh -huh. What if you are planting in existing raised beds? Okay, if, if you're planting in, that's a great question. If you're planting in an existing raised bed, all I would do is get um, a soil mix to put into it. Are you, is there soil in there now? If there's so existing soil and you just want to enrich the soil to make it better, this Harvest Supreme, that's my favorite planting mix available out there. Get that and mix it 50-50 with the soil and get your tomatoes and plant it and then get your dry organics and just spread it on top. What I'm doing here is, is pretty high end and it could get very expensive too. So cutting costs a little bit, if you already have existing beds or you're going directly into the ground and you just want to enrich what you have there, go with the Harvest Supreme. That's a really, really good product. I've had excellent results with it. Um, and that'll, that'll get you going the, the pretty close to the same thing I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yes, and Sarah says, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so again, we're filling up these, uh, uh, these 45 gallon containers. And I put this, um, this mesh, this is contractor's mesh. This is what they use for uh, making driveways. I lay that in and pour the cement. So you can see how heavy duty these, these are. They're very sturdy and your, your tomatoes will not fall over. So you can see how we're building up. So we have, this is the completed. This is what my, um, my pots look like today. This picture actually was taken today. Uh, we're ready to plant. Uh, I've been a little bit slow on picking up tomatoes. I have a few things growing in the greenhouse. We're gonna plant probably 30 different varieties this year. Um, last year we did 50 
And then the year before that, during pandemic, we planted 100 and it was just too many for me to take care of. Um, so this year we're kind of downsizing. I'm going with a lot of my favorites, which I'm gonna tell you what my favorites are in a bit. Uh, but, and we always try new ones. So you can see we're ready to plant here. Okay, choosing, I call them toms. That's one of my slangs. So choosing your toms. So determinate, indeterminate, hybrid, heirloom, what does that all mean? And this is extremely basic. I apologize for this, for those of you that know this, but these are just basic things that I, I do with most of my tomato talks. So determinant is a bush tomato. It's a smaller bush. It um, doesn't require any type of support, although you could if you wanted to, to help it a little bit. And you mostly get your tomatoes will, will ripen at the same time. Um, Better Bush is one of my favorites. We put these in smaller pots. These will do very well in a 15 gallon can, but you're not gonna get the selection and the uh, um, varieties that you would with an indeterminate tomato. Now your indeterminate tomato are your popular ones. Those are the ones that are out of control, that'll grow big, you need staking, but you're gonna get a lot more varieties and you're gonna get a lot longer uh, uh, amount of tomatoes. So if you read in here, it says varieties continue to grow and produce tomatoes all along the stems throughout the growing season. Just for uh, just to let you know, there's over 20,000 different kinds of tomatoes. I've probably grown a thousand of them. And that sounds like a lot, but when you, when you uh, put it next to the 20,000, it's not very many. So there's a lot of different varieties of tomatoes. Indeterminate plants need extra tall and strong supports as we talked about prior in the prior slide with the contractor's wire. Because indeterminate shoot out so many shoots, gardeners often prune them for optimum size fruit or train on trellises. Don't prune, no harm done. I don't like to prune my tomatoes. I like to let them go crazy. I'll say this and I'll probably say it again, but a tomato's a weed. The less you do, the better you're gonna get. And also a lot of people tend to prune their tomatoes and then guess what? You're gonna get sunburn. Um, those tomato leaves are designed by that plant to protect the tomato. So people prune their tomatoes and then the tomatoes exposed and you end up getting some sunburn out of it. I don't do any pruning, I just let them go. I try to encourage the plants to grow up the, the uh, stakes or the, or the cages and um, keeping them contained, I might clip some back so that they, they stay within confinement. But as far as pruning them for better growth, I don't, uh, I don't feel it's necessary. Now there's a, some people that want to get in there and really do that and spend a lot of time doing that. Again, I don't have the time and the desire. My whole objective here is to get as many tomatoes as possible. So you got hybrid and heirloom. A hybrid is, is pretty much two different tomatoes that have been crossed. And an heirloom is a uh, seed that's been over seven years, grandmas, there's different types. An heirloom is generally considered to be a variety that has been passed down through several generations of family because of its value characteristics. The hybrids, you're gonna always get more tomatoes from. Whereas your heirlooms, you're gonna get unique varieties, you're gonna get unique taste, you're gonna need, you get unique colors, sizes, you're gonna get that strange module look on some of them. Um, I tend to only do about half of my tomatoes heirloom just for the fun of them. Some heirlooms produce a little bit more than others, but if you're looking for a tomato that produces a lot and will give you the higher yield, you wanna go with the hybrids. And just on the top of my head, I'm gonna give you a list in a minute of, of, of my selection for this year and some of my favorites. Um, Japanese hybrids are by far my, my best tomatoes. So if you're over a green thumb buying them and you see that those Japanese hybrid signs, pick those up. Those are the best. Um, so let's go here. Okay, back here. Okay, here's you have a question. Okay, go ahead. How do I harden off my seedlings? And this one's from Sarah. Okay, Sarah, if you're, I'm doing the same thing, but we do plugs a lot. I did do some seeds this year. We get them in the greenhouse. And then we transition them over to underneath like shade closer to the house so that it's a little bit warmer. The shock of coming like out of a greenhouse and right out into these cold nights. Remember the nights are your, your key here. It can, they can stunt them. 
and they'll they'll make the foliage look kind of um, almost like they're burning. So you want to gradually bring them out. We have two ways to do it. We take them from the greenhouse, and I put them into a cooler greenhouse, and now we're bring we're bringing them outside. As long as it's over thirty four degrees, you're fine. You're gonna be okay. Um, it's when it gets under 32 with 30, you're, you could freeze them. So just gradually bringing them out, it's, it's okay. And if they shock, they usually come back without any problem. And again, remember, the tomato is a, wor a, a weed and um, you want to stress them. They like to be stressed. The less you do for them, the, the, the better off they are. We have another question or we, we should I keep going? Okay. We do have a comment. Okay. Um, this is from Jill. She says that Renee Shepard has said heirlooms do not do well in Southern California. That's not true. I've grown, like I said, I've grown a thousand different tomatoes and we got tons of heirlooms. And um, last two years, again, buckets and buckets of tomatoes came out of the school here. Um, I have several areas that we, we grow and I help people, but um, no, uh, that's not true at all. And only reason I'm saying that is because I grow them. And these are a lot of the heirlooms that are on here that on this, this picture is stuff that I've grown. And they're great. They're loaded with them. But you're not going to get as many as you would a, um, a hybrid. So if you're looking, with, did that answer your question? I hate to say, I hate to disagree with anybody. Maybe he just didn't have success with certain um, heirlooms, but I've done this for 30 years. And every year we do, we do different ones. And especially the last 10, the last 10 has been when I've really pushed and, and tried to get as many different tomatoes as possible. Does that Bill answer says, question? good to know, yes. And you want to come out and see, you can come visit me. The proof is in the pudding. And also just to tell you guys, I have a YouTube channel and there's 10 videos I have on my YouTube channel on how to grow tomatoes from the very start to the finish. And that was all filmed last year. So there's 10 videos. They're about three to five minutes each. And it starts out for by prepping the soil, choosing the tomato, um, all the way up to harvesting. And um, you'll see that, that I would say half of the tomatoes we grow are heirlooms. So just going through some of my favorites, the Ico is the Japanese hybrid, uh, black semen Russian heirloom, black truffle, a Japanese hybrid, blue boar berries. I kind of liked that one. That one we did last year. Blush. These are all I did last year. And, and I'm going to tell you the ones I'm going to redo again. Uh, blush. Carbon is good because it'll take the heat. Cherry red, chocolate sprinkles, green zebra, Kellogg breakfast, lemon boy. And then you got your mama taros, uh, the gold, the red. I'm gonna say mama taro is one of my top five. Uh, Napa Chardonnay, that's a small, uh, the size of maybe a ping pong ball, but it has a touch of wine flavor to it. It's pretty good. That's a great heirloom. The Reiki red, red beef steak is a good one. Another Chinese or Japanese hybrid. Spoon, this is a novelty one, but it's fun and the flavors are great. The size of the tomato is uh, like, like caviar. It's, it's just, it's, or no, not um, salmon eggs. If you're a fisherman or ever been fishing, you get that salmon egg bait, that's exactly what they look like. Sun gold cherry, a very big favorite of mine. I always plant two of those. Sweet tangerine, Cherokees. All your Cherokee heirlooms are great. Solar flare is a fun one. And then all the brandy wines I really like. And then the old standbys, Better Boy, Beef Steak. Uh, I didn't see my early girl here. I always plant an early girl. But um, this year I'm gonna plant the Ico, the Carbon, Chocolate Sprinkles, Green Zebra is one of my favorites. Lemon Boy was really, really good. For some reason, um, we planted the Lemon Boy last year and I don't know whether a squirrel dug it out or a raccoon, but we lost it, so I didn't get it. But very, very prolific and great, great flavor. I'm gonna plant any Japanese hybrid I possibly can get. The Napa Chardonnay is gonna be done again this year. 
spoon. We're going to grow a whole bunch of those in smaller containers to give away just as a novelty. Sun Gold Cherry, I'll be doing two of those. Sweet Tangerine again. Whatever Cherokees I can get a hold of, I'll do. Um, and then again, the Better Boy and the Beef Steak. And then who knows? I'm, I'm sure um, I buy a lot of stuff from uh, um, John over at, at Seagro's. And I go over there and find really cool varieties. And uh, Green Thumb carries carries Seagros if you're uh, interested in a very top quality tomato. Do we have questions on varieties? Uh, yes, from Crystal. Which is your favorite Japanese hybrid? Mamataro. Mamataro, by far my favorite. I would say, you know, it, it's kind of like your favorite band, you know, or your favorite album. How do you how do you pick? But I'm gonna say. The Mam Mamotaro is my top five. Green Zebra, um, Sun Gold Cherry. I'm going to say right off the top, those are my, my, my favorite one. Or Lemon Boy. Lemon Boy is top five, too. So there's four. Um, I don't know. There's so many out there. And it, it would, the best way to grow tomatoes, especially maybe if you're going to grow 10 plants, go out and get five hybrid and five heirloom, plant them up, take good notes. And any of you avid gardeners, which I know all of you are, the best thing in the world as a gardener or working in the gardener or horticulturist, take good notes. Because the following year, you want to go backwards and take a look and see what, what worked and what didn't work. So you're going to do a tomato diary of sorts, exactly how you planted them, what you did, your watering, which ones did good. So the following year, you can pick those or don't pick them. And um, yeah, so th those are about my first top five. Any other questions on there? Yes, there's another question from Sally. Any okay. varieties recommended which are verticillium wilt resistant? Sorry if I okay. butchered that it, word. It's verticillium wilt and, and there's fusarium wilt, there's verticillium wilt, there's the phytophthora, there's a whole bunch of different diseases that can attack your tomatoes. But the verticillium, if you look on the labels, usually the label will have um, a code on there saying that they're disease resistant. I don't have too many problems with diseases on the tomatoes. And if I get a tomato plant that, that does get disease, which it's rare, it's pretty much I'm gonna just yank it out. But if you're concerned about a certain disease or especially verticillium or fusarium, um, there's, a, there's a couple others that I, on the top of my head, um, I, I always smile at verticillium because that, that, that's the number one killer of olive trees. I live in Silmar, which at one time was the biggest olive grower in the United States. And all our olive trees are dying for verticillium. So I kind of go, oh. But um, most of them are disease resistant, especially your hybrids. Your heirlooms, you're gonna get more problems because they're not hybridized to be protected by that. So look on the label. On the labels, you're gonna see um, a code for that. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Okay. Um, Any we other have questions? another, yes, we have another question from right, Crystal. Right. Are okay. we talking about growing from seed or just small plants? Um, if you're growing from seed, I would have tried as your hardest to get your seed growing earlier. And somebody previously uh, talked about hardening off. And if you're growing them inside or in a greenhouse, you want to kind of gradually bring them out before you plant them. Uh, I prefer uh, if I'm just going to go out and, and plant my tomatoes, uh, I'm going to go buy the small plants. I think you can get your better varieties and a stronger plant coming out of a, out of a nursery. Um, if you're going with organic, take a hard look at the tomato. If the tomato plant is a dark, dark green and it says organic, it's probably not. Your organic tomatoes are going to be a little lighter green. They're also going to be a little more expensive. But there are, I would say, half of the half of the tomatoes now at Green Thumb are organically grown. Uh, but I would I would prefer to buy a small plant rather than go with seed. And then we have another one from Jill. Okay, Jill. What do you, what do you think of the so-called winter tomatoes, ones that will grow in a Southern California winter? I think Siberian is one. Siberian, Oregon spring, um, 
So, so I, we did a whole bunch of them last year. You don't want to call them winter tomatoes. You want to call them late season tomatoes. And what you do, you plant those in September. That way they get a good go. And um, then you're harvesting in November into December. And we have very warm winters lately too, whereas they can grow through. I, I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't get that many tomatoes off of them. It does work, but you have to get the proper varieties. And, and they're, you know, some people call them winter tomatoes. I call them late season tomatoes. And the key is getting them planted in, in September, October when it's still warm and they get a good start. And then as it gets cooler, you're picking your tomatoes in November and December. But personally, November 1st, I'm planting spinach, lettuce, broccoli. Uh, I love my winter vegetables. So I wanna save all that extra room for, for those kind of um, vegetables. We do have another question from Sandy. Okay, Sandy. Every one of my tomato plants were eaten last year by some animal. How can I protect them? I grow in pots and on a raised planter. Okay, well, first of all, you gotta identify the animal and what it, what's eating it. Is, it. is it an insect? Is it a mammal? Um, we're gonna get to that in a few minutes. If you can hold off, I've got a whole bunch of, of resources for that. Are we good to go or should we have another question? We are good to go. All right, that's me. These are tomatoes we pulled out of the greenhouse last week. Um, we're taking them right now and we're hardening them off. I'm going to be giving away these on um, Saturday at my talk. Okay, time to plant. Plant them deep. This is the one plant, and there's a couple others. I did broccoli really deep this year. I found that worked that worked good too. But because they're annual plants, you can get away with it. Be very careful. All of you horticulturists know the worst thing that you can do is plant a tree, a plant, below the crown and you're gonna get rot. Um, landscapers are notorious for doing these things, especially that they don't know what they're doing. Uh, so be very careful with all other plants. I, I have a hard time teaching this to people, especially high school kids. Oh, you can plant this deep. Then they think they can plant everything deep. But the reason why you wanna plant a, stra or a, a, stra a tomato deep is because you'll get extra roots. So you can see what it says in here, you know, it's because the plant will have a better, stronger root system. You can put almost the whole plant down in the ground. And especially now when it's a little cooler, plant it down and those roots are gonna to start to grow and you'll have a stronger plant. So you can see how deep we plant these. Now this is the last- question too. Okay, go ahead. From Sandy. Uh-huh. Do you reuse the tomato pots to grow other plants after your tomato harvest? Mm, well, we did a couple, a couple of the pots we put um, sugar snap peas in and because of the cages. So yeah, now we have three or four pots that are full of sugar snap peas. And what I'm gonna do with those is I'm gonna cut them down to about two inches above and I'm gonna plant beans around them. And uh, the reason I'm doing that is because of the, it's a legume and it, they, they release nitrogen. So that soil is just gonna be loaded with nitrogen. So hopefully the beans take off. I've never done this before with them. So I'm gonna do that. But the answer to your question a little bit, but what we do with the soils, we'll put it into our compost bins. Um, we do some really big composting here. I have six 10 by 10 containers here at school. And a couple of the food banks bring their, their, uh, their rotten vegetables and we put our leaves and our straw and, and then I top dress it with, with soil like this and it keeps the flies down, it keeps the smell. So answer to your question, yes and no. I reuse the soil in the compost bins, but um, we did do a couple of them with peas. All right, and we have another one. Sandy says, thanks. You're welcome. We have another question from Wynn. When planting so deeply, do you remove all of the leaves to the stem that are underground? You know what? Yes, you should. You, you're going to strip the sides. I don't know if I have, a, I don't have myself doing it. I have another one. In my videos, it's, it, it shows you doing that. Yes, uh, remove those side leaves. Um, you can pinch them off. I like to use like scissors and cut them off. 
because sometimes you can tear it and it'll go right down the stem, probably won't hurt it. Now, on the other hand, I've just put the whole thing in the ground and just like maybe an inch of the plant left it above the ground and it worked fine too. Again, remember these things are, are a weed. I found, I saw some of the best tomatoes I've ever seen growing on the railroad tracks with no water or anything. It was just a volunteer and growing crazy full of tomatoes. But if you're doing this, I would cut the leaves off. Yes, that's, that's definitely a, a good idea. All right, and then another question from Rachel. Okay, Rachel. Is it okay to plant basil in the pots with the tomatoes? You can. Um, I'm like a kind of a, it depends what kind of basil. Now, if you're doing the Genovese or the Italian basil, that's gonna require more water. And the biggest problem with tomatoes is too much water. And that's the next thing I'm gonna talk about. So if you're planting anything other than a tomato in these containers or in the same bed, you're gonna have problems because those other plants need more water and your tomatoes don't. So personally, no. Now, if you were planting something like a Thai basil or an African blue basil, um, perhaps because they're more of a woody shrub and they're not gonna get as, uh, not need as much water, but I would refrain from that. I would stay away from that. All right, thank you. Okay. And then another question from Drew. Okay, Should true. we pinch any flowers on starts? Does this delay yes. or reduce fruiting? Yes, that I like to do. The first, the first grouping of flowers, take them off. And this also is very important if you're growing strawberries. Um, we just planted 3,000 strawberry uh, uh, bare roots last month. And right now, every day of this week, I have students picking off the flowers off of the strawberries. What that'll do is that'll encourage the roots to grow. And then the next, the first crop of strawberries will be a lot better and you'll get more out of it. And this goes well with the tomatoes too. You can look on the, on the slide to the right and you'll see uh, one of, there's a little yellow flower there. I pinched those off. So the first grouping of um, flowers, especially when they're young, yes, pinch them back. Great question. That's it. Okay, let's go. Okay, there, there's all our tomatoes. This is hopefully what it will look like um, next week, if all goes well. Again, make sure you stake your tomatoes. You see how nice those plants look? There is one plant in each container. This is a really, really good example of how big an indeterminate plant can get. I made this mistake and I'm sure you folks have and other people, you get a raised bed garden, you get a four by four raised bed garden and you wanna put six tomatoes in there. What happens? You have a disaster. So be careful, each tomato, two by two by two. And um, you're gonna get a lot more bang for the buck. If you go with a smaller pot, you're not gonna get as good of a root system and your yield won't be as good. It's not, I'm not gonna say that you can't do it, but it's better if you get a larger container. Just assume, I think most of you know what a 24, bo 24 inch box looks like. That's the perfect size for a tomato plant. All right, just because I wanted to throw this out to you, these are hay bales and we planted some tomatoes in the hay bales just for fun and it was okay. We planted determinant bush tomatoes, but if you're ever gonna do this just as a novelty and have fun, you wanna make sure that you season the bales first, put down a lot of organic matter and water it in for, for a few weeks prior to planting. And it's kind of fun, but you know what? It made a mess. And also you'll find that hay is not a good thing to top dress your garden with. Does anybody know why? People, people go, oh, Mr. List, I'm gonna put hay all over my garden and uh, uh, it's the greatest mulch, it'll keep the weeds down. Hay is loaded or straw bales is loaded with weed seeds. When they're harvesting, they're sucking up the, not only the straw and the hay, but they're sucking up weed seeds. So when you're spreading out hay around your garden, you're gonna add a lot of weed seeds. So these hay bales turned into tomatoes plus weeds, but it was fun. Just wanted to throw that out. I don't think I'll do it again. It was just a mess. 
Okay, here's a, somebody talked about keeping their um, uh, tomatoes from getting eaten. Now these beds, I had uh, the city of LA built them for me up at Lopez Canyon. And the reason I needed this is because there's deer and there's rabbits up there. So you can see what we've done. And these cages open up. And each of these, these are about, I think they're four by six. And I only planted two tomatoes in there um, the last couple of years. And they completely filled them up. And then I, you can literally pick the cages off completely or you can open them up. So this will help keep your mammals out. It's not gonna keep the bugs and the insects out. So if you identify what's eating your plant, that's half the battle. But if you don't know what's eating it, you don't know what to treat it. How are we doing on questions? So far, none. Good, okay. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, all right, problems. I wanna go over this real quick on the different problems. Number one problem on a tomato plant is over water. Okay, everybody has grown tomatoes and they get these beautiful giant green tomato plants and no tomatoes. It's because you're keeping them too wet. Now going back to here, once I've planted these, I'm gonna keep these plants wet for five days. Then I'm not gonna water again for three weeks. I'll soak them and probably another three weeks. I will let these things dry out as much as I possibly can. Now, as they get bigger, like these to the left, a tomato plant will trick you. Late in the afternoon, they'll start wilting. They'll start looking like they need water. Be very careful. Don't do it. Wait till the next morning. If they're wilted in the morning, give them a drink. But you're also using a moisture meter and digging down maybe about six inches and then going in with your moisture meter. Remember this soil that we're using holds the moisture in. And you wanna, you wanna see if it's wet down below, like a foot to 18 inches down below. Let them dry out, okay? Very, very little water. Number one problem on your toms is over water. I get this all the time. They come to me and they, or it's just the opposite. They'll come to me with a horrible looking plant. And the first thing I'm gonna look at them and I'm gonna go, well, do you get tomatoes? We get so many tomatoes, Steve, it's crazy. I go, well, who cares what the plant looks like? Your objective with growing tomatoes is to get as many tomatoes as possible. So be very, very careful with over water. Anybody that's ever grown tomatoes probably has experienced blossom end rot. And especially on your Roma tomatoes. Roma tomatoes are your, uh, the spaghetti, to I call them spaghetti tomatoes. They look like pears. Those tend to get the blossom end rot where you get a little bit of um, like dying off right at the end of the tomato. Some people say it's a calcium deposit, lack of calcium. I don't agree with that. I, I believe it's a, an inconsistency of water. And that could be too much, not enough, or let's say you're watering twice one day and once next five days, something like that. Be consistent on your watering pattern. Um, but also what I would do is just take those tomatoes off and usually the second crop, they're gone. But they tend to attack the aromas more than anything. Tomato hornworm, that could be one of your worst ones of all. They don't usually start attacking your tomatoes until maybe uh, when it gets hotter, May, June. And the if it's best thing is just to go in there and pick them off. Um, I don't like to spray a lot. It's not that I'm anti-insecticide. The problem with spraying, once you start, you're gonna have to continue doing it. Once you start spraying, you're gonna disrupt the biological balance and you're gonna be killing all your beneficials too. So be very careful about spraying. Uh, if you have to spray and if you have to, if you have a really bad tomato hornworm uh, um, infestation, um, there's a product called uh, BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria that is harmless to humans, which will kill the, um, um, the worms or the lepidopter larvas. And that works really well. Um, the other one is spider mites, which is extremely hard to control on your tomato plants. Generally, you're going to get spider mites at the end of the, the um, tomato's life. Uh, when it gets extremely hot, they seem to attack. When I start getting spider mites, it's usually in August 
when it's hot and then I'm pretty well done. I'll start pulling them out. It's real hard to control. Um, they attack the underside of the leaf. I don't, again, I don't like to, to do, use a lot of pesticides on my, uh, on my vegetables. Um, there are some, uh, uh, the spinosad, there's the uh, neem oil. Be careful of, of your oils when it's hot. But the problem again, you have to spray the underside of the leaf and it's very difficult to do. But those are the worst problems um, that I, I found with tomatoes. On here, I don't know, oops. Uh, some people say rotate your crops. Don't plant tomatoes in the same spot. I'm not. I'm going to kind of disagree with that because I've planted in 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 our beds over and over the same spot with tomatoes. I've not had problems. Uh, if you're planting raspberries, don't plant your tomatoes after you plant your raspberries in the same place. That could have a problem. But most most of your tomato plants are so disease resistant, it's not a big deal. Pinch off the leaves. You see something that doesn't look good. Um, foliage, make sure that the foliage doesn't stay wet, no overhead watering. Choose disease resistant varieties. Uh, remove debris, diseased tomato, plant debris. Provide adequate air circulation. And again, at the end, try to keep your foliage dry. How are we doing with questions? Okay. All right, this is what we're supposed to have, right? Is this our end result? Now I have not done a tomato tasting. The last tomato tasting I did was with Steve Goto. And I believe it was at Anna Walt Lumber we did it. And it was just, it was just amazing. And I'm gonna cross my fingers, I'll be able to do one this year. Probably, I'm gonna say in July into August, we'll be doing a tomato tasting. I'm gonna try to do it at all my um, LA City uh, lectures. A lot of fun doing the tomato tasting. And then I get an idea of what people really like and what I want to plant again um, next year. Steve, we do These have are... two questions. Okay, good. One from Drew. Given how hot our summers can be, especially recently, what is the latest you would plant tomatoes? Well, again, that's what we were talking about, trying to get your tomatoes in as fast as possible. And this way you're starting to produce fruit in June into July and then August. Last two years, we've had mild, very mild Julys and they've been probably the best tomato growing seasons I've ever had. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, three seasons ago, we had a hot July and then you, you start getting the tomatoes don't like anything above hundred degrees. They're not happy. And then also you start getting spider mites. So try to get your tomatoes in as soon as possible. If you live in um, Southern California, San Fernando Valley, LA, if you live up in Valencia, Lancaster, you're probably a month. You know, Valencia, no, but Lancaster, probably another month. Um, so try to get them in as soon as possible so that you're harvesting in, in July. Right, and we have a few more questions. Okay. And just to let you know, we are uh, at 25 right now. So the first question is, do marigolds help control disease? Well, marigolds, not necessarily diseases, they, they can help with repelling insects just because of the aroma in the plant. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it's more of a novelty. Um, I've seen it done. And again, if you're going to be planting, let's say, marigolds in with the tomatoes, you're going to have to water those marigolds a little bit more the tomatoes so be careful maybe plant them in some pots around it um i don't think that they're going to help with disease they can help with insects maybe not sure um but you know it's worth a try all right and the next one why do raspberries negatively affect tomatoes now, how far from a yeah, that's, that's that somebody taught me that if they plant raspberries you take out the raspberries and you plant a tomato, the raspberries, I believe it's fusarium. Don't quote me on that, but they, they, had, they can have um, an adverse effect on the soil prior to tomatoes. That's just something I've heard. I don't plant a lot of raspberries. They tend not to do as well in Southern California. It doesn't get cold enough. Um, I would, if I'm going to go any berries, I like the blackberries and boysenberries, but I have a tough time with raspberries, but that's just something somebody taught me. 
Um, perhaps some of your other horticulturists uh, um, here can elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, I don't think a lot of you are gonna plant raspberries and then pull them out and then put tomatoes in, but it was just something somebody taught me because we were talking about rotating crops. So it came up. Well, how far from a raspberry plant can it, can tomatoes be safely grown? Well, I opened up a can of worms with that one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the second part oh, to the question. No, I should have done. I just came up with that with on the top of my head because we're talking about rotating crops and not planting in the same. And somebody had told me that years ago. So it came up. I'm not going to answer that because I'm not sure. I um, I don't think, I think a couple feet shouldn't be a problem but if you know the growing characteristics of a raspberry or any raspberry they're gonna they're gonna they have rhizomes and they're gonna start shooting roots out here and there and they can get very invasive so they could shoot over into your tomato but i wouldn't worry about it. plant your tomato if it does great don't worry about it if it doesn't hey you know what the raspberry plant's probably a lot more important than that tomato plant all right, and a question from Sally. What do you feed with during the growing season? And ah, good question. We did not get, get at that. Okay, now if you're doing the lasagna method like we talked about, um, all it's layered down there and your plant's gonna grow into that dry organic and the organics are gonna break down slow. So as the roots go down, it's gonna start hitting those layers of dry organic. That's part of the fertilizer. I use a liquid fertilizer, and if you look in my videos, you'll see I use a liquid fertilizer and I foliar feed and I root feed every time I water. And I'm only watering every three weeks for the first uh, couple months. So um, using a liquid organic, uh, again, Kellogg's GMB is very good. If you wanna just use fish, that's fine. If you have some Worm farms, use your worm tea. Uh, again, if we're doing organic, if you are a synthetic person and you don't care, um, your miracle grow. I use grow more on, on my, um, on my um, uh, ornamentals. And that's the same thing as like a miracle grow, but it's just a different company putting out a, a, um, it's, a it's a powder you mix with water and um, pour it all over the plants. But I like to use the more fertilizer, the better liquid organics. Right. And then because we are just at 8.30 right now, um, I do want to thank anyone who has to, who has to leave. This webinar is being recorded. So anything we don't get to um, or any questions that you want to stay on for Steve for a little longer, we can answer that and we'll have the recorded on our website. And I also want to remind everyone about one of our upcoming events. It's gonna be one of our first in-person events of 2020, 2022, excuse me. And it's a garden tour of Pierce College, the Arboretum and the Horticultural Center there. And it's absolutely free to SoCal Hort members. We do ask for a suggested donation that we're raising for Pierce College to support their horticulture students. And you can find all of the details to that um, in the chat, I've posted the, the link that takes you directly to our website that talks all about that. And as well, we'll be next month, we are going to be hosting Frederic. And my French is no bueno, as you can tell, I'm better at Spanish. And we are going to be hosting uh, Frederic Lavoy Pierre, formerly of Santa Barbara Botanical Gardens and Pacific Horticulture Society, who will be talking about her new book, Garden Allies. And that will be next month's webinar. And then uh, be on the lookout this weekend because we will be posting about our upcoming horticultural sale on Saturday, April 2nd. Getting all my, I'm trying not to get all my dates mixed up. That's a lot. <laughs> but again, follow us on social media, check back on our website and we'll have all the information up to date and you can get all the details too. So uh, Steve, we do have a couple more questions. Go ahead. And this one's from Rosalie. How do you make your cages from the contractor material and secure in a circle? Well, it comes in, it comes in rolls. So we just, uh, actually we were making some more today. We were short from, from last year. So I had another roll laying around and you just open it up and um, measure around the pot, figure out how, how, what the circumference is, 
And I have a pair of bolt cutters we cut with, or you could use tin snips, but a little difficult. The bolt cutters seem to work good. And then I just roll it back out and stick it in the pot, fill it with soil. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're gonna grow your tomatoes the way that I just suggested, it could get a little expensive. So it's it could get pricey. So you wanna try to improvise. You don't have to use the contractor's wire. That's probably the most durable, but you could build your own cages. You could put stakes, you could put wire. Um, but you know, if you're gonna use those little uh, uh, tomato cages, make sure you put um, three stakes in there also, cause they'll, they'll fall over. So you could build your own. I've tended to use the contractor's wire because it, it's pretty foolproof. I've, I've never had it fall over. The next question from Sandy, what was the material around the enclosed raised beds? Was it over the top also? Uh, I think maybe the ones that the city of LA built oh, for the, you. The ones at Lopez Canyon, um, the cages, what was it made out of? Well, chicken wire and wood, and probably they used the cheapest wood they could possibly get. Um, I imagine it probably, they probably won't last more than three or four years. Um, I don't want to say redwood because that's a little pricey. I think, wh what's your concern on there? What, what's the reason for the question? Where to buy the wood or what to get? Well, Sandy hasn't elaborated more, but uh, Sandy did ask, was it over the top as well? Yes, yes, because of birds. So it is a completely enclosed cage and also, they put um, chicken wire underneath it. So that before they put the beds, I told them to put a layer of chicken wire to prevent the gophers. So you you got gophers, you got deer, you got rabbits and birds. So all those things. And up there at Lopez, it's um, you're right next to the mountains. So you have every critter in the world out there trying to get the get our fruits and veggies. Yeah, and Sandy, she elaborated a little bit more. It was about the product being used. She's in Sand Canyon and she thinks she has rabbits. Uh, that, yeah, that's probably the only way that you're gonna do that. Rabbits are, rabbits are terrible. They're, I mean, they, everybody thinks they're cute and I like them too and I don't wanna kill them. I, I, I go look at that cute rat. But when they start eating up all your plants and your grass and everything, it, it, there comes a point where you gotta do something. So if you don't wanna, trap them or you know what them, then put a cage around your plants and then enjoy your rabbits and your vegetables. Right, and that's so far all the questions. We are at 35, so we do wanna respect your time as well. Did you have a few more slides you wanted to go over? I think that was it. Um, I'm just showing you some of our peppers. Uh, real quickly, I don't like to plant peppers until, um, the end of April-ish because it just doesn't get that hot until then. Peppers like a lot of heat. So I try to, um, I'm, I have a lot of lettuces and spinach and uh, winter vegetables and we're going to harvest those as much as we can. And then when they, they start to either bolt or die out, then I'll tend to go into my peppers. Uh, I am growing them in the greenhouse, so I'm getting a head start. But peppers tend to sit in the ground and not grow at all during March and April. They'll, they won't grow and then all of a sudden you'll get all that heat and then they'll start going crazy. Peppers require a little bit more water and they like nitrogen. Um, I'm a big fan of organic nitrogen using blood meal. So I, I use a lot of blood meal on my peppers but they do require a lot more water than um, your tomato. I don't think, yeah, that was pretty much I apologize, I don't have more, but I just threw this together. Again, I'm gonna- uh, That was a lot, that was a lot, very informational, very fun too. Good. We had a ton of questions that came in. I hope And we do okay. have, we do have another one from Brenda. Okay. How do you protect tomatoes against squirrels? Well, just like we did before, you have to get those cages. You have to put something surrounding it uh, because they're gonna, they're gonna get in there and nibble and eat. I think, I have not had too many problems with squirrels on the tomatoes. Um, rats have been a big problem. Um, not necessarily here, but at my house, I've had rat problems. Here we have a lot of stray cats that, that, that tend to keep the squirrels and the, 
rats away. Um, but also here at school, the squirrels seem to enjoy the cafeteria food. So they leave us alone. Uh, but again, go back to the cages. Let's see if I can. Yeah, that's the best way. Cage them up. All right. And then the last question is more is more of a request. Can we see your t-shirt before oh. we go? <laughs> Rock and roll. Rock and roll. I couldn't, nice. find, I couldn't find my tomato shirts. I was looking and that's the only one I, I have. If you follow me on social media, I always have crazy shirts. And uh, I guess it's one of my trademarks over the years, but uh, yeah, th this has been fun. It's been interesting. I hope I was okay. I, I apologize. Um, yes, I'm a little intimidated. I started to look at some of the people that are online. Some of you know me, I know you, and uh, we have a lot of experts in your club. Um, I would love to join the club. I, I think um, uh, the beginning when you were showing all the plant material, I was just going, wow, you know, I don't get that kind of teaching. You know, that's, that was almost like my days at Pierce College. And I'm, I'm always willing to learn. I'm one of those horticulturists that can't stop learning. I learn from everybody. Again, I know a little bit about a lot of things. I don't know everything about anything. And uh, we're in the right place here. Yeah, but we all need to open up and know that, hey, there's ways to do things. And we, we get a lot of knowledge from everybody. And uh, it's such a, a, a broad uh, a subject that we could never learn at all. That's for darn sure. Um, I'm going to continue my studies because I have to deliver it to the students and then my talks too. Um, but again, tomatoes, that's one of my favorite things. Steve Goto taught me a lot. I'm going to try to carry the message. If any of you would like to come by and visit me at school, the garden is absolutely beautiful right now. Our wisterias are in full bloom. All our fruit trees are popping. Looks like it's going to be a very, very good year for stone fruits. And I'm very surprised. I don't think we got that much chill hour, but you know, you never know. And we did not get enough uh, water. So I've been bumping up the, the uh, sprinklers on the stone fruits this last couple of weeks. Um, but it's, it's gorgeous right now. So if you'd like to come by, we'd love to have you. Just give me a call, text, email, and come out and see me talk for the city. You're always welcome. And then I'm gonna try to get, or I am gonna get you some plant material um, over to your sale so that everybody gets some stuff. And if you don't come to that sale and you want a few plants here and there, come visit me. I never say no. And Steve, can you show us that last slide again with your Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube yeah. channel? There we go. So if you guys want to get a hold of Steve, you have him on those, those four channels. And if you have trouble reaching him, please feel free to reach out to us, socalhort at gmail.com, and then we will connect you. Steve, thank you so much for thank this you. presentation. Had a blast. Hope to see everybody soon. Hey, enjoy your Likewise. tour of uh, Pierce College. Any any help we could get to get them back to where they used to be, that would be great. I mean, you have all the support in the world from me, and um, I'm sure you're going to have a lovely time over there. I heard it's starting to look good again. Yeah, we're really excited. We're going to have two tours, one in the morning at 10 and another one in the afternoon at 1 p.m. And where, so, what date? This is on Saturday, March 26th. Oh, I have my Lopez Canyon and then the rare fruit growers are coming for a tour here at school. So I'm going to be a little busy. All right, you guys, thank you. Hope to talk thank soon. You. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and we will see you at our next event. Bye, Steve. Bye.